That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Raymer. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Popcorn hits, so it's time to go home. You can find more podcasts, more resources. You can also contact us by going to thatsoberguy.com. Also follow us on Instagram at that sober guy podcast. All the links from today's podcast will be in the show notes, so they're very easy for you to find. So happy to be here with you today. You don't know whose you are. Do you know who you are? Do I know who I am? Many of us really don't know who we are. I'm still learning who I am every day, as a matter of fact. I know who I'm not. I'm not who the world says I am. I'm not who other people think I am. Or maybe a better way to say that is I don't find my identity in what people think of me. I'd rather put it that way. I'm not who the little voice up here in this brain, you know, that little voice who likes to creep in and tell us all the things that beat us down. It says things like, you're weak. I'm not weak. Although sometimes I feel like it. Likes to tell me, oh, you're sad. I'm not sad. Although sometimes, yes, I do feel sad. I'm not a loser with a drug and alcohol problem who doesn't know how to navigate life on his own. But I'll tell you what, I sure felt like that about 10 years ago. I'm not a bad father, I'm not a bad husband, I'm not a bad son, I'm not a bad friend, but I've felt like all of those things at one time in my life or another. And you know what I want to say to that little voice up there? Shut up! Shut up! It's not me. Not me. Not me. So then the question becomes, so then who am I? Who are you? That's the title of today's podcast. You don't know whose you are. You don't know who you are. You don't know whose you are. Who are you? Who are you? You taking pills like a superstar, but you covered with some brutal scars. (laughs) I love it. I'm referencing a Dylan Chase song. For those of you who haven't heard Dylan Chase, great artist, um, got a lot of good content out there. And that song is, is, is called Who's You Are. It's off the 2018 album, Joyful Loser. And it really reminded me when I started to uh, think about this, this concept of identity and who am I and how many times I've asked myself that and that song came to light. So it's a great song. I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, but have, have you asked yourself that before? Who am I? Like, who am I, God? Like, how, how do you see me? Um, do you know who you are? Do you think you know who you are already? You know, if, if, if that's the case, I would probably, if someone came up to me and said, I know 100% who I am, I'd probably run the other way because I think in that statement or in something like that, if we were to know exactly who we are, 100%, and I'm not saying we can't be confident in knowing ourselves and knowing our morals, our values, our beliefs, That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that if we were to say that 100%, that would leave no room for growth. That would be perfection. And so to me, it's impossible because we're, if we're open, if we're open to what God's doing in our life, we're constantly growing. So for me, I don't think I started to gain some clarity and I'm talking about just the infancy stage of it, of who I might be until I ditched those wranglers. And I started to take an honest look in the mirror. I think I was about 32 years old. And I happened to, uh, to, to quit drinking around that time. And uh, I went and got some help. And I came back home. And it was very confusing. And uh, I didn't really know still who I was, who my wife expected, to, expected me to be, who my friends expected me to be. Uh, I didn't know who I was as a father. I didn't know who I was as a son go down the list. I just did not know who Shane Raymer really was. And so I have told this story before the Wrangler story. Some of you may have heard it if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, but I wanted to share it again because it's, it's so relevant to this topic. So, I mean, I, I'm an old school California kid. I grew up in the skate culture, punk rock, uh, punk rock, hip hop, 
Uh, I'm, I'm also an athlete. I love baseball. I love competing. Like I wear dickies and vans and hoodies and I love the California lifestyle and the California surf and skate and, and punk rock Bay area, hip hop culture. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, it's been in me since I was a kid. I grew up with it in some ways, I guess. Yeah, I guess you could say in some ways it's a part of my identity in this world. At least, um, I don't wear Wranglers. Or I should rephrase that because I still actually still do have a couple pairs of Wranglers, but they're like Walmart Wranglers. They're not cowboy Wranglers, okay? But towards the end of my drinking years, I was literally so lost. I just had no idea where I was. I go to rehab. I get sober. I come back home and there's so much confusion. I'm soul searching. Um, I, you could definitely call it an identity crisis. I literally had no idea who I was this new sober guy. How was I going to do this? How was I going to not have a crutch of alcohol to help deal with life? I have no temporary escape anymore. No escape from feelings, man. I got to feel stuff. What? No, (laughs) I don't want to do that. So I decided when I, you know, as I started to kind of pull myself together, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to be a working man. So what does a working man do? I bought some Wranglers and I dove in. (laughs) And just let me say, there's nothing against Wranglers. I actually love Wranglers. I wish I could wear some cowboy Wranglers. I just feel goofy in them because it's not me. I I think they're awesome. But I remember I was sitting in the parking lot. I don't know if I had just gotten something at the grocery store. It's like a Lucky's parking lot here in Vacaville. And I happened to run into Seth. And for those of you who might not know, if you're new to the podcast, Seth is one of my best friends. He really helped to put me on a path to to kick in alcohol and on this new this new life path. And uh, we've known each other since we were kids. He knows me. He knows I don't wear Wranglers. And I'm sitting in my car and I, you know, I think he was walking out of the store or something and he comes up to the thing and we start talking and, and he goes, he kind of stops midway through and he's like, hey, bro, are you wearing Wranglers? <laughs> and like I said, these are like cowboy cut Wranglers, not my Walmart style Wranglers that almost look like normal jeans. You know, that these are straight, the, you know, the cowboy style. And I go, yeah, they are. And he kind of laughed and he's like, yeah, okay, all right, bro, sweet, man. <laughs> and, and I kind of I kind of felt dumb in the moment and I kind of just didn't give a crap either because I was just like so just confused in where I, where I was, where I was at, who I am, who, who am I? Um, and, and so there was this identity crisis going on, this battle between who I was supposed to be, who the world saw me as, who my friends saw me as, who, who my wife, my family, who the world saw me as really, I had no concept of who God saw me as. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But I decided to quit drinking alcohol. I I quit putting substances in my body after 17 years of of, of doing so, trying to escape. And um, alcohol and substances really changed my my mental state. And it prohibited me from not only learning who I am, but it also prohibited me from feeling and connecting to something higher. I had no spiritual connection, even though, and I've talked about this before too, I was raised in the Catholic church. I I did catechism. I had a concept of God. I believe in God. I believed in God back then. I, I, I did, but I just had no connection. There was no relationship to something higher. And I was trying to find my identity myself through human eyes and through how the world saw me and how, through how people see me and saw me. And, and I've come to the conclusion today that that's nearly impossible, at least to be free in that. Like I only saw myself in the flesh and I had a very skewed view of the world and what that looked like for the first 32 years. Um, now, I do believe that God was always with me, even even when I didn't know it, even when I didn't recognize it, even when I didn't appreciate it, even when I couldn't see it. And man, I am like today, I'm so grateful for that. Like I, I can't even believe it. It, it blows my mind, to be honest. Um, and it doesn't mean that at those times I couldn't feel God's presence like with me, but it does mean, like I mentioned before, there was no relationship with God. Like there was some religion there. There was some, some general understanding. Yes, I believe in God, but I, there was no relationship and he was always there. He never left me. He never abandoned me. 
And I, you know, I've come to believe today that's because he's so good. That's because he loves me so much. And I want to tell you right now in this moment, as you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're at, no matter who you see yourself as, no matter who others see you as, God loves you just the same. He loves you just the same. And he loves you so much. And even when God should have abandoned me, not just for all the stupid things that I did and stupid things that I said, but probably just for wearing, let's just start there. Just for wearing Wranglers, he probably should have just bailed on me and said like, yo, bro, like, no, you're not doing that later. I picture him up there. He's like, look, fool, this, this dude thinks he's like a cowboy now. He watched Young Guns and Rehab. Now he thinks he's hanging out with Billy the Kid and working as a ranch hand now. He's a working man, yeah. <laughs> I was just so confused. I just didn't. I wish I had a picture of that too. I don't think I have any pictures of the Wranglers, but you can you can probably picture it yourself. It just is very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable for me to think about, as a matter of fact. Um, but who does God work for? Does he work for me? But I was still working for myself at the time. I was still very self-serving, even though I was sober, which is why I was still out there wandering around having this like identity crisis in a sense. And I think everything comes in time. You have to be patient. You have to be understanding. You have to be able to sit in times that aren't, you know, that aren't where we want to be necessarily. But how does God see you? Let's just propose that question. How does God see you? How does something higher than us that we can even we can't even wrap our brains around? Like, what does that look like for you? And I can tell you that to get a lens on that, to start to accept that and to start to see it and to open up to it has been a huge battle in my own walk. And it hasn't happened overnight, at, not even close. In my experience, there's been three areas that most of us, including myself, can tend to identify through when we're stuck in the world. So I'm gonna give those to you real quick. We see value we see our worth, uh, we see popularity, we see our identity. And we usually see these things through, through, through these three things here. It's performing or our performance, how we perform for others, how we're performing in the things that we do in day in and day out. Uh, the second one is our stuff or our belongings or our possessions, what we have, what we own, what is attached to us. And then the third is what other people think of us what people have said about us or what people have done to us in some instances or what we've done to other people. It's people in general. Those are the three things, performing, stuff or belongings, and people. Now, I'm reading a book right now by Benny and Wendy Perez. It's called Thinking Like Jesus. And in chapter two, it talks about this performance lie. It talks about the possession lie and it talks about the people lie, which is really what inspired me to do this podcast today because I have just, experienced all three of those in in the last 10 years. And man, it's, it has taken some time to start to understand what that is and the, the, when, the, why, the, how, all that stuff. And I'm still working through a lot of it. And, uh, I want to say too, just like counsel, you know, I talked to a buddy of mine today who was going through some stuff and I asked him a question, like, who do you have around you that it speaks into you that is like counsel for you. And and he, he didn't have anybody right now. One of his, one of his friends passed away, you know, a short time ago, who was that kind of guy. And, um, I just want to say like, it's so important that we have brothers around us, sisters around us who can, who can be there to support us, to encourage us, to, um, bounce ideas off. It's, it's imperative for us to do life like in our families, in leading as moms, as dads, as sons, daughters, as um, in our marriages, everything. It's so important to have a council around us that's going to help us with this. And, and last year, I dove into a buddy of mine, uh, Matt Ariano from Fuel Ministries, one of my favorite guys. Um, he has a 40-day Bible study for men, and um, it continues to have a huge impact on me. And, uh, I, and, and that, that is, that is somebody that I could call at any time and say, Hey, what's up, Matt? Like, man, I'm really, I'm struggling here. Or what do you think of this? Or just, Hey, what's up, man? How are things? Um, 
you know, at the beginning of January, I also read uh, Pursuit. It's a 21-day prayer and fasting devotional by Pastor Dave Patterson, another amazing dude, um, leader, mentor, somebody who I really look up to. Um, all of the above, along with some of my other mentors, like my good friend, Buddy C, who I happened to just talk to before I recorded this, and we haven't talked in a while, and it was so great to catch up with him. I texted him afterwards and was just like, man, like that just put a spark in my heart. And, and we've had over time, like some, some things have changed and evolved and our, our relationship has grown as friends, as um, him being my mentor. And I hope he's learned some things from me and my own walk at the same time. Um, it's, it's just amazing stuff, you know, and he's one of those dudes. Another one is uh, uh, Pastor Tim Nally, another great dude who's taught me so much. My buddy, Jeremy White, Pastor Jeremy, for, he's been on the podcast with, uh, with Dan and, and uh, Pastor Peter, another one too, man. Like so many great dudes, in my, in my life. Um, and I, I'm reminded of this too. I was complaining one time about my own, my own dad here who I love very much, but I have to love him from a distance. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in this podcast today. But I was complaining about that one day and buddy told me, he said, Hey, will you stop? Like quit your, quit your complaining, quit your crying. Look at all the great men that God has put in your life. To, to fulfill any voids that maybe that your, that your dad was just not capable of doing. It's not his fault. It's nobody's fault. It just is. So get over it. I, and I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically what he said. And it was just like that profound honesty, straightforward, and a light bulb went off in that moment. And it set, it didn't change everything immediately, but it set me on a path to acceptance and really working through a lot of the stuff that I, that was hanging me up with my own, my own dad. So I know there's a lot of dudes out there who struggle with, with issues with your father, your earthly father here. And if that's you, man, where are other dudes that God has put in your life that fulfill that and that help you there and can help you through that? Because I promise you they're there if you look and they're probably closer than you think. So and one more last thing here, my wife, you know, in that council of men that are around and can help and can counsel when, when I need to talk or whatever, my wife is amazing and um, she has really been at the, you know, the, the foundation of a lot of this and pushing me and keeping me moving forward. This, you know, newfound pursuit of prayer and practice um, that she has continued to support, but really helped like push forward and challenge me on stuff. Even when it like makes me mad sometimes I'm like, Oh dang, like, why do you got to say that? But like and deep down, I know it's the truth. Like, man, um, it's just been huge. So, let me just say real quick, I just want to say thank you to everybody who I just mentioned, of course, and then to everybody else. I have such a, a list of, of people that I'm so grateful for. So thank you to everyone out there. Um, I, I know that there, I, I have a feeling that this path, um, you know, that I continue to go down in my faith, in my walk in sobriety and being a man, a husband, a father, it's going to have some potholes and I'm, and I'm learning how to accept those, some twists, some turns along the way. And the, the more that I am aware of that and the more that I think that if you're listening to this, that you're aware of that, like it's not perfect. It doesn't look perfect. If it's perfect, there's no room for growth. You're in a fantasy land. It's not how it looks. It's not what it is. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be ups and downs. But here's what I'm certain of. I'm very certain that it will never go back to being dark like it was 10 years ago as long as I keep my eye on God, period. So I'm just going to kind of stop there and go into these points and let's start breaking some of these down. The first one that I mentioned in finding identity, trying to figure out who we are, who are we in this world? Who are we as God sees us, the performance or performing? Um, some of us, including myself at times, have identified ourselves through our performance or how we perform. I'm very, very guilty of it. I had a, a, a terrible experience with this all my life, really, thinking that I had to live up to these expectations, these standards. I had to prove myself to be worthy. I had to prove myself to others. Let me show you. I'm going to show him. I'm going to show them. And that's no way to live. It's impossible. It's empty. I remember this feeling of identifying through performance even as a kid. And when I didn't perform well, let's say maybe I struck out at baseball. Like I was at a game and I struck out or I made an error. That was even worse actually than striking out. Or maybe even I messed up at home. I didn't do something I was supposed to do or something just wasn't right. Like I was my own worst enemy. Always so hard on myself. No grace, no mercy. Kick my own butt inside and out. And I, I was just so hard on myself. And 
Um, it was, it was a really tough way to live as a kid. It's really a tough way to live as an adult as I got older. And I think that's why I probably turned to alcohol is more of a crutch as I did get into my twenties is because I just didn't like myself. I didn't know myself. I was not graceful to myself. There was no, there was a, a huge gap between loving myself and not even having, well, I don't know if that makes sense. I just, <laughs> I just didn't know. I didn't love myself. I had no grace period. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so let me ask this as, as kind of a question, I guess here, like, why do we feel like we have to perform in order to feel worthy, in order to please others, in order to look good, in order to feel good, in order to prove to ourselves, in order to prove to others, in order to prove to God how great we're doing. Like, why do we have to feel like we have to perform? Or why do we feel like we have to perform? Like, it's literally exhausting. Like, I got so tired. I'm still tired of it because I still do struggle with this a bit. Um, it's an ongoing thing. It's a practice like anything. Uh, I've been tired of it. But when I look back, it's really what I was taught. It's what most of us were taught and, and kind of conditioned to think we're victims of our environment of this conditioning to think that we need to perform in this world in order to be worthy, in order to be accepted, in order to be loved. We need to be great at what we do. And let me say, I'm not saying we can't be great at what we do. I want to be great at what I do. I want to be good at what I do. But it's what culture says we must do to be accepted, to fit in, uh, it, it, that we must perform. And that's the only way we're going to do it. And I'm, I'm saying that that is not, that's not true. That's not true at all. So it's like, oh, I need to perform to gain your approval. I need to perform so you like me. I need to perform so you think I'm cool. I need to perform so you think, uh, wait, actually, I need to perform so you can't see my underachievements, all the things I fail at. I just need to overperform to compensate for that. I need to drink or get high so I can loosen up, so I can perform, so people don't see that I'm really broke and sad and an empty little boy stuck in a grown man's body. And all I want to do is be free from this performance and take this mask off, but I don't know who I am. So I just keep trying to perform day in and day out. And I hope that I don't ever have to sit still and be quiet and just be me. But wait a minute, I'm not even sure who that is anyway, because I can't even begin to see me as God sees me. So I'll just keep performing. We perform in work, in school, in our relationships, in church, in groups, in recovery meetings, our hobbies, our golf game, our sex life. We perform. Okay, wait a minute. Let me just stop right there. Let me just say this. God, if I stop being able to perform sex with the Jess, please just bring me home. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm just messing. All right. I'm just messing around, man. But for real, I mean, you know, there's, there's places we still want to perform in, right? In a sense, like my golf game is another one. I'd like to keep that intact. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're tracking. Maybe you're not. Maybe, was that, maybe that was a bad joke. It's okay. But here's the point. We're constantly having to perform and it's literally exhausting just saying that stuff and, and thinking about the performance level of life is literally exhausting. I wanted to share a performance that I, that I can remember that came to mind. Um, and I was so desperately seeking approval at this age and, and my home life, like my parents love me. They did the best they could. They were so young. I've shared it many times on the podcast and in, in different posts and um, talked about it many, many times. So I'm not going to go too far into the, into the home life thing here, but let's just say that it, there was, you never knew what was going to happen at any time in, in the moment, like in my home growing up, there was a lot of dysfunction. There was a lot of alcohol and it was just, it was just uncertain and it made for a very uncertain environment. And so my reaction to that initially was to learn to run and then to seek approval from outside sources and to be liked and loved. And that's probably why I'm such a people pleaser at the same time too, still having to <laughs> deal with some of that stuff in my own right. That's a whole nother story. But I was so desperately seeking approval um, and, and to be cool. That was another big one too. I just wanted to be cool. I just wanted to, people to like me. I just wanted to have friends. I just wanted people to to look up to me in some senses, but I was so empty inside. It was the strangest thing to me too. Um, but fourth grade, check this out. I stood up in front of the whole class and I rapped ice, ice, baby, <laughs> ice, ice, baby. Yo, VIP. Let's kick it. 
okay, I should just stop right there because now I'm going to wrap the whole thing again like I was in the fourth grade. I do love that song, though. It's pretty hilarious. It's a great song. But that's a true story. I stood up in front of the whole class. I had Miss, Miss Lee was my teacher in the fourth grade. I'm trying to remember if my buddy Ray Penny was in that class. I just talked to Ray the other day. We've known each other since first grade. I think he was. If he ever listens to this, he'll, he'll know what I'm talking about here. But Miss Lee, do you remember those little um, recorders that were like flat? It was like a flat cassette recorder. It was probably like the size of a shoebox, maybe, maybe a little smaller. And then it had the the like five buttons on the end of it. It was like play, pause, stop, rewind, fast forward. And you popped it up and then you put the tape in. And then you could set it on a table or where, wherever you wanted to set it. And you hit play and then it played the tape. Well, that's, I brought the tape in, the vanilla ice tape. And I gave it to Miss Lee and I was like, Miss Lee, man, I really want to wrap this in front of the class, man. And now I'm, just, as I'm thinking about this right now. That was so amazing of her to be like, okay, sure. You can wrap vanilla ice in the fourth grade in front of the whole class. That'll be awesome. Here you go, Shane. And she let me do it. And so I did it. I put the tape in there. I stood up and I remember she put it on like a little bar stool thing she had. And I stood there and I just wrapped the whole song. <laughs> and I, I wanted approval so bad. I wanted to be cool. I just, um, I think maybe even there was a bit of like rebellion in there too, because I knew standing in front of the whole class and I saw this baby was huge at the time. It was either really stupid or really risque to step out and do that. And I figured, Hey, maybe it'd separate me from the other kids and I'd, you know, gain some notoriety and I'd be cool. And they didn't have the guts to get up there and do it. So I was going to do it and I was performing. And I think there's a difference between, performing in a manner of, uh, of identifying and performing in a manner of really enjoying to performing. And I probably had a little of both in that, I guess, because I do enjoy a good performance sometimes. Right. But when we're seeking approval from it, man, that's rough. We can, you know, we're, we're so, we're so stuck in that. And here's what all, here's what God wants us to do. And it, at least in, in my walk, here's what I think that God wants us to do. It's not to seek approval of man or the approval of the world or our classmates or our friends or our work, but it's to do all things to glorify him, all things to glorify God, no matter what it is that we're doing. And when we look at it like that, it eliminates the need to perform and gain approval from man. We don't care anymore what man thinks. We let go. We let go. That's it. You know, a friend of mine and, and coworker, uh, his name's Adam Wright, and uh, he's he's actually some of you guys know I produce and host a, a, a large for a large company um, here in California, a corporate podcast platform. And uh, I was talking to Adam; he's a great dude, and he's very high up in the company, and he's got a lot of responsibility. And uh, I asked him this question in one of the podcasts we were doing. I said, "You know, Adam, what's your purpose?" And he could have said all kinds of things. He could have said, oh, my purpose is to lead my family or my purpose is to, you know, drive this business forward and, um, you know, serve our communities and, um, or, or my purpose is, you know, he could have went down the list of anything that's purpose because he does a lot of purposeful things in life. And you know what he said? He said, my purpose is to glorify God in all that I do. And I was like, Dang. That wasn't that long ago either. It was towards the end of last year, middle of last year. And it blew my mind. It was like a light bulb went off. And I was like, man, I'm missing it. I'm missing something. There's something I'm not getting right now because I'm not glorifying God in all that I do. I'm glorifying my own self in things that I do, my own attitude, my own wants, my own needs. And yes, we have wants and we have needs. But if we're not turning to God in everything, And it's so hard to do sometimes. I get it. I I don't even understand it sometimes. You might not understand. You might be going, man, he sure is saying God a lot. (laughs) I know. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. Check this out. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So wrapping Ice Ice Baby in the fourth grade was funny. Maybe it was cool. I probably gained a few friends from that performance, maybe a little elementary school notoriety. Man, but I was performing out of the need to be accepted, to prove that I was worthy, to be liked, to be loved. 
Uh, and let's be honest, it was kind of fun too. You know, it's kind of fun. I'm, I'm glad I did it. But the point is, if we create our identity through performance, that's where God says, no, that's not what we're doing here. That's not what we're doing. All things to glorify him. I don't need to gain man's approval. I don't need to gain man's acceptance. None of that. I'm worthy as God sees me. I'm worthy of his love. No matter what you've done or what you haven't done. And when we honor God first, when we ask for forgiveness of our wrongs, we put him first, we glorify him first. Um, hey, we don't have to perform anymore. And I got to say, it's so liber- uh, liberating to look in the mirror, take the mask off and finally see yourself through the same lens as God sees you as, or at least to start to see. I'm not saying that I got it all figured out in that. I don't, but it's a whole different perspective. And he sees you as his son. He sees me as his son. He sees you as his daughter. But you don't know who you are. You don't know whose you are. Who are you? Who are you? Keep coming back to that. It's going to make sense at the end, I promise. Point two, stuff, belongings, things, possessions. What about our stuff, our belongings, our possessions? I think, uh, I think George Carlin said it best. Everybody's got their stuff. This is my stuff. That's your stuff. That'll be his stuff over there. That's all you need in life, a little place for your stuff. Can't do a George Carlin impression as well as I'd like to, but you get the point, I think. I love some George Carlin. But everybody has their stuff, right? You got your stuff. I have my stuff. We identify many times through our stuff. Now, having stuff and identifying through stuff is too totally different things. Just like performing and identifying through performing is different. Like two totally different things. So let's, let's try to try to think about those in, in the context of, of each one. Cause it, I understand it could be confusing. And I say that because I, I like to have stuff. I'm sure you like to have stuff too. We need stuff to survive. We need stuff to have stuff. Like I'll give you an example. I love my Titleist golf clubs. I love them. First brand new set of golf clubs I've ever owned, by the way. I bought them, I don't know, I guess a year and a half ago now. Uh, I was so excited, too, to get those those clubs. Like, they improved my game a little bit, too, I got to say. Whether it was in my mind or whether it was just, like, you know, the clubs actually did help, which are probably a little of both. Probably a little of both. The clubs definitely helped. And and when you buy new stuff, it makes you play more because you invested a little bit of money into it. And then you get better because you're playing more and then your mindset shifts a little bit because you're like, hey, I got Titleist clubs, yeah. And you hit better because you think you hit better. Oh, it's man, this must be this new club I just got. (laughs) It does help. But here's the thing. I don't identify through my Titleist golf clubs. That's the difference, okay? Those don't make me. Those don't make me who I am. I'm not a professional golfer. I'm not somebody who's the most amazing golfer now because I got Titleist clubs and that's my whole identity is wrapped around a, a golf club. It's not. I mean, then we kind of have the competitive side of that too. It's just human nature. Like who has the better stuff? Who has the better golf clubs? Who has more of it? And notice how even like even that, I just got to say that right now. I had to point out that I had Titleist golf clubs, right? Just in case you said, hey, I got some new Wilson clubs. I could be like, mine are better, bro. <laughs> mine are Titleist. Yours are Wilson's. Mine are better. That's like that competitive human nature. Like in... It's even it's in me still. We're all. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. It is funny, um, but we have to identify it too. We have to take a look at it. It's like we'll see some dude. Like let's say his name's Chad. Like look at Chad over there. Chad's got all. And no offense against the Chads out there, by the way. Look at Chad. He's got it all. Chad's got all the stuff going on. He's got dirt bikes. He's got a boat. He's got new golf clubs. He's got a 67 Canary Yellow Cadillac Coupe de Ville on triple gold Dayton, son. What? Sure, that's not me. I don't know. Maybe. I'd like to. Chad's got a nice home. He's got a pool, a trailer. Hey, trailer trailer people, where are you at real quick? Check this out. Let's move all of our stuff from our house into a trailer and go park it somewhere out in the dirt by a lake. And then we'll hang out there. And then we'll drive it back home. And we'll take all of our stuff out of the trailer and put it back in our house and our garage. We're trailers, trailer people. We got trailers. 
I'm not hating either. I just actually wish I had a trailer because tent camping kind of sucks these days. Just kidding. Actually, I really love tent camping. It's probably my favorite. Backpacking in particular, like out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, I'm getting off track here. No, Nobody cares. Nobody cares, Shane. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about your backpacking trips or your trailer wants and needs or your tent camping. But everyone's got their stuff. We do. We got it all. And we're competitive. And we try to keep up with the next man who has better stuff because it's human nature. And if we're not careful, here's what happens. We start to identify through the stuff we have. I'm guilty of this myself. I've had a, a great revelation as of lately. Thank God that I've been so guilty of this in trying to, to f- fulfill needs and, and, and wants in order to prove stuff through, through stuff, through things. You know, and, and I did. I started to identify through the car, the house, the vacations, the clothes, the golf carts. I got a golf cart, by the way. Don't be jealous. I know. You, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Oh, he's got a golf cart. Golf cart coming through. I felt really good a couple years ago, too, when I bought the golf cart. It's like, and I, I, here's, I got the golf cart so I could drive my son and our family. The kids use it. So, well, not so much. They, Lucy tries to steal it sometimes, but, or did try to steal it sometimes in the summer. But I, I really got it because we live right behind or on the other side of the Little League fields. And so I know I'm coaching my son in Little League. I knew we we're going to be having practice there. So I bought it so we could drive the golf cart with all the gear over to practice. And when I bought it, the bank account was stacked. I was like, yeah, yeah, I got this. You can't see me. Nope. Oh, shoot. I'm driving a golf cart, bro. Now, have you seen how much eggs cost? <laughs> It's a little different lifestyle we're living today than we were, you know, roughly two years ago. Thanks a lot, Biden. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm joking. Don't get all mad. Just messing with you. I really don't care about red or blue. I'm not a crip or a blood or a Republican or a Democrat at this point. It's all an illusion, the Hegelian dialectic. Okay, I'm getting off point here. I'm getting off topic. I don't care. You don't care either. Okay, here it is. Here, here's, here's what I'm getting at here. What is, what's the point to this? check this out. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's Matthew 6, 19 through, 19 through 21. I need to take a quick drink, drink of water here. getting a little bit parched there and i got the amazon guy hanging out in front of my house right now what are you doing bro i don't know he's not bringing me anything i tell you that much not that i can remember at least you guys have that problem too you order something and then you just forget you don't even know what you don't even know what you order it's like oh i just got a package on my porch i wonder what that is maybe somebody sent me something. and then you open it up you're like oh yeah that's right i ordered this like well if you have two day shipping two days ago all right all right, all right, Shane, reel it in, reel it in. Bring it back, bring it back, I'm bringing it back. All my stuff is 100% meaningless at the end of the day. Let me say that again. All of my stuff, all of your stuff is 100% meaningless at the end of the day. And if I treasure my stuff over my relationship with God, over my relationship with Jesus, well, my heart will be stuck in this world of stuff, which for me is empty, broken, and sad, no matter how much stuff I have. Trust me, I've tried to stuff my heart, to stuff my feelings, to stuff my brokenness with so many different things, and, and none of it ever worked. I can remember at times just being, just, just hurting, just literally hurting and trying to stuff Alcohol, drugs, food, go down the list of things, money, sex. I mean, there's, there's a list of them and I'm sure some of you experienced some of those or all of them. And if you haven't, you're a liar. I'm just kidding. (laughs) You know what I'm saying though? We're, We're this, it's not anything new. We've all experienced this stuff, whether we want to admit to it or not. We've tried to stuff down, stuff things and, and we still are empty and we wonder why. We go, man, why do I still feel I had X, Y, and Z? Like I, I did that, I got that, this happened to me, it was great, but I still feel empty inside. 
you know, I used to think that it would be like if I could just buy a house, man, if I could just buy a house one day, then I would feel so uh, fulfilled. Then I'll have made it. Then I'll be worthy. I'll be so worthy if I could buy, I put that in quotes, buy a house one day. You never really own your home. You just rent it from the bank. Let me just say that real quick. Yeah, we bought our house. (laughs) We don't rent anymore. We bought it. Do you own or? Oh, he's just a renter. (laughs) Look, I don't own my home. The bank owns it. Just be clear about that. And even if I pay it off, I still got to pay taxes on it every year. And if I don't, they take it. So do I really own my home in, in, in my estimation? Not really. But I'm a whole, totally different point. But I never owned a home like my family. I shouldn't say I was a kid, but like our family, we never owned a home growing up. And I always thought that that was like what made us worthy. Like we lived in apartments for most of my life. We rented a, a house for a year here or there, a couple of different homes, but for the most part, we moved around a lot in, in pretty much the same area, but it was from different apartment to different apartment. I always identified that I was less than because most of my friends owned their homes, or at least they lived in a house and our family lived in apartments and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with living in an apartment. To be honest, I could live in an apartment all day, every day. Maybe you just say, oh, it's because you grew up in that and you're just used to it. I know some people hate apartments. It has its pros and cons, both. But anyways, we're not here to debate apartments or houses right now, so just stop, Shane. So our family grew up in apartments. It was natural for me to, um, like, well, just put it like this. I always wanted to own a home, and it was such a big deal to me that when Jess and I did buy, I put that in quotes again, our first home, I was so happy. I was thrilled. I was so excited. Um, I, I was. I couldn't believe it, really. I was like, wow, we just bought a house. Like, how amazing is that? And it was amazing, and I'm so grateful for it. We had some help along the way, a lot of help along the way. And here's the thing, though. Nothing changed. Like, nothing really changed. The only thing that changed is when something broke, I had to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have upstairs neighbors anymore, Tommy. So that actually, there, there's a few things that changed that were nice. I got to say credit where credit's due, but it, it did allow us to do some things also like hang out in Huntington beach for a year when we sold the home. So there was definitely some benefits to it. I I'm, I'm so grateful. I don't mean to undermine that, but my point more or less is this. We had some of the most amazing times and some of the most amazing small groups and family time, not in the home that we owned. And we had some great times there too, but we, man, this time in, in not in the, the one that we owned, but it was in the 1100 square foot, $1,400 a month condo that we rented over on Christine drive. We had some amazing times there. It didn't matter that we rented it. We didn't have to own it. That's where Jess was saved and her life was changed. Um, I'd even argue that we didn't, even though we didn't have a lot of money at that time and we didn't have a lot of stuff that season when the kids were little and we were so hungry, just in this mad pursuit was probably one of the best times and the best seasons of our life. And I think Jess would agree with me on that. Like, look, your worthiness doesn't come from whether you own your home or not, or because you have a, a bunch of money in the bank or you have a bunch of stuff. It doesn't come from if you have navigation in your car or you use a Thomas guide and a compass. For those of you who know what a Thomas guide is, you're welcome. (laughs) God doesn't care about your stuff. Here's what he cares about. He cares about if you know him. He cares about when you know him. He will provide the stuff that you need. That's what he cares about. He, 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 He loves you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants you to submit to him, not just surrender, but submit to him. So whether we rent an apartment or whether we own a home, we're in a contract, right? Let's just, let's, let's, before we get to the next, the next and last point, we're in a contract. So let's say we're in a 12 month lease. We're in a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 3.125. I wish it was that low, but we're in a contract. We're in a contract. Get a car payment. You're in a contract. We've established now that God doesn't care how much stuff you have to fill the apartment. If you own your home, if whatever, and we've established that God doesn't care if you're in a contract with a person or from a bank. Do you know what 
he wants. He wants you to be in contract with him. He wants a contract, a covenant, an agreement, a relationship with him. Your stuff means nothing to him. Your identity is not valued in how much stuff you have or how much stuff you don't have. It's valued in how much you know God, how much you love God, and how much you love others. And if you want more of God or more of self and more stuff, you pick because he gave us free will. He gave us free will. And we get to choose how we put that perspective into place. I've been on this lately so much every day. He must become greater. I must become less. More of him, less of me. More of him, less of me. Do you know the only thing he cares about is if you know him, if you love him, if you love others, that's it. It's not about perfection. It's about pursuit. I'm not perfect. My pursuit is hot right now. It's hot. Thank God. My stuff, your stuff means nothing. You didn't come into this world with any stuff. You don't take any stuff with you when you die. Neither do I. So stop identifying through your stuff or your bank account. And look, I'm talking to myself right now. I'm not talking at you. I'm talking with you. Stop identifying through your stuff or your bank account, Shane Raymer, right now in this moment and you who is listening to this. Stop. God doesn't care. All he cares about is your heart for him. And if you know him and if you pursue him, that's it. And when we start to understand this, we can start to identify ourselves through the eyes of God, not through the eyes of our stuff or through the eyes of our performance. Or if we own a stupid golf cart, which I need some batteries for, by the way. (laughs) Anybody got a jug on some golf cart batteries? I need six Trojans, 48 volts. That'd be great. It's such a bummer, man. Those things are expensive. I don't know when... $1,500 $1,500 became the going rate. Well, it's probably, I don't know. They probably went up over time, but in any case, you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. Who are you? Who? We're trying to figure it out right now. We're trying to get some, some clarity on it. All right, point three. Point three, and then we'll wrap it up today. People and the lies of people. You formed a false sense of identity through what people think of you through what they've said about you or for some of you, for some of you listening right now by what some broken human being did to you at some point. The words and the actions of people can have a positive effect on our lives, right? They can also have a very negative effect on our lives. And I really didn't understand how powerful words are and and how words can be used as weapons until I had kids of my own. My words are weapons in which I murder you with. Please don't be scared. Please do not turn your head. Oh, a little P. Roach right there. Shout out to Papa Roach. Love those guys, man. It's a song's tightrope. It just reminded me my words are weapons. But our words are weapons, right? And seriously, I I didn't start to think about that until I had kids of my own. Let me, let me kind of break into a quick example of this. So I mentioned baseball. We're a baseball family. We love baseball. I love playing catch with my son. As a matter of fact, when I get off of uh, work today and get done with all the stuff I got to do because I'm so important, <laughs> saying that very sarcastically, by the way, I'm going to go outside and play some catch with my boy. It's going to be fun. Now, when I go outside and play catch with him, if I was to say to him, hey, Cash, I'm going to throw the ball to you. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. I'm going to throw it, but don't drop it, okay? All right, you got that? What do you think is going to happen? He's more likely going to drop the ball because I planted the seed of doubt in his mind by saying, don't drop it. Hey, bud, I'm going to throw it to you. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. He's going to drop it. Oh, nine times out of 10, probably going to drop it. Alternatively, I could say things like, Hey, Cash, you're such a good ball player, buddy. I love playing catch with you. I'm going to throw you this ball, and you're going to catch it every time, bro. You are going to catch it because you're an amazing ball player. Odds are that he catches it almost every time. And if not, well, then maybe he's a swimmer and needs to try soccer or something, but you get the point. And I'll tell you what, that is how I talk to him. Hey, Cash, you're going to catch this. You're, you're such a good ball player, buddy. Man, I'm so proud of you. You're so, you're, man, you're doing great. You're learning. You're getting better. 
Even when he messes up, if he doesn't catch it, oh man, that's okay. Hey, pick it back up, throw it again. You're going to catch this one because words are powerful. Words are powerful. Actions are powerful. And we have to be very careful in what we say and how we say it. And I wanted, you know, I want to share this and I was a bit hesitant to share it, but I'm going to anyways, just because it's, um, it's, I think it's a powerful story and I think it needs to be heard. And I think there's, um, I, I think there'll be some, uh, some clarity in how powerful our words are. And I'll, I'll just start there, I guess. My dad, Chris Raymer, who I love very much. I do love him very, very much. I kind of have to love him from a distance these days. In fact, I've had to love him from a distance for for a long time now because he moves around a lot. Sometimes he's in Nevada. Sometimes he's in California. Sometimes I don't know where he is. But my dad, believe it or not, when we start to see ourselves or see our parents as people, he was once a teenager. He's a person. He's not just my dad. You know, I just want to say that we, we hold on to that stuff and we convict our parents so often of the things that they should have done this better or they should have done that. And then we create resentments and we don't forgive them and we are mad at them and we're angry. And it just, man, there's no room for that in this life. It's too short. Your parents are people. My parents are people. They're not perfect. And maybe they've done some really jacked up things. And I'm sorry if that's you out there. Like I, like my parents aren't perfect, but there's plenty of people who had it way worse than I did. And I used that as an excuse for many years, even though it wasn't easy always at home, but it's easy to use that stuff too and create excuses and create that victim mentality. And I'm telling you right now, it, it serves nobody any good, especially us, the people who create that victim mentality. And that's, that's a huge cultural issue right now that I'm not even going to get into right now because I don't have, you know, 10 hours to, to talk about it. But the victim mentality, not good. Um, but my dad was once a teenager. He was once a, he's a human being. He was once a teen when he was about 15. And man, I'm realizing right now in this moment as I say this, that he was only three, at 15, my dad was only three years away from having a baby boy and naming him Shane, which would be me. Yeah, ding, 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 you're brilliant. <laughs> but it's crazy to think of. It's crazy to think of that at 15, he was three years away. Okay, so why do I keep saying he was 15? Okay, when he was about 15, he took a couple of fishing poles and him and his buddy went down to the creek out on Mount George Avenue in Napa, California to fish. My dad had a little sister named Wendy Raymer. Wendy loved my dad so much. She loved her big brother. She idolized him. She looked up to Chris, her big brother. She followed him everywhere. She used his baseball gloves. She used his pencils and pens. She tried to draw like him. She loved him. She loved all her brothers and sisters too. My, my, the Raymer family has a, a big family, all my aunts, uncles. But she liked to follow my dad down to the creek to go fishing. And she liked to follow him even when he told her not to this day. To follow, don't, don't follow me down there. So on this day while they're down at the creek fishing, and after Chris, my dad, 15 years old, told his little seven-year-old sister, Wendy, not to follow him and his buddy down to the creek. Somehow, Wendy managed to make it down there and to pick up and mess with and break one of the fishing poles. And this made my dad, Chris, 15 at the time, so mad. I don't know why I keep reiterating that. I guess maybe it's for my own things. Like, man, I can't, it's hard to picture him as 15, but he, he yelled at her. He got pissed. He got so mad. I told you not to come down here in the first place. Go home. I hate you. That's what he said to her. Go home. I hate you. So Wendy, disappointed in herself, and sad, she put the fishing pole down, put in the dirt, hung her head, walked out of the creek, up the long uphill driveway, and back to the house on Mount George Avenue. Later that evening, Chris headed out to Lake Tahoe for the weekend with one of his buddies going there to hang out a little family getaway with his, I think it was, I'm not sure what buddy it was, what family it was, someone close with the family though. And they went to Tahoe, hung out. And, uh, the next day, Wendy and one of the neighbor kids were out in the field on Mount George Avenue, riding the Raymer family horse, which the horse's name was Sonny, big, beautiful white horse. Now, no one so at least the what I've asked around, and maybe now since I'm sharing this, someone will 
talk about it a little more. I don't know. No one really knows exactly what happened or it's, it's never really been talked about, but somehow Wendy either fell or was pushed off of Sonny and she fell down off the horse and she hit her head on a rock and the neighbor kid got scared and he ran, he ran home and he left Wendy laying on the ground after she just hit her head on the rock. Now at this point in the story, it's a little bit foggy for me because you got to understand this was something that was a huge tragedy in our family. Um, it's, it it was never really talked about because it just, I think there was just so much pain and hurt and all the things there. Um, so I imagine that I'm not sure exactly who found her, how they found her, what that part of it looked like. I don't know. Um, all I do know is eventually they took her to the hospital and, and she was in bad shape. And the next day as, as my dad, spending time with his buddy and his buddy's family in Lake Tahoe. He got a phone call that he needed to come home. And when he asked why he needed to come home, he was told that his little sister, Wendy had had an accident and she probably wasn't going to make it. Now, I don't know what that must've been like going through my dad's head at that time, a 15 year old kid, confused, angry, scared, probably ashamed and, and, and feeling guilt knowing that the last time he saw her, his little sister who he loved so much, who the family loved so much, she was beautiful. The last time he saw her, he was angry with her and he scolded her and he said something that he wished he never said. Our words are weapons. Our words are weapons and we have to be careful what we say, when we say it, who we say it to. Wendy did end up passing away um, and her passing really did leave just a brutal, brutal scar on our whole family, the whole Raymer family. Um, obviously, especially my, my dad, my uncles, my aunts, my grandparents. Um, and here, here's what I believe and, and why, am I, why am I saying this right now? Because I feel like I know someone needs to hear this right now. That left a brutal wound on my dad's heart that I believe has never been healed until this day. And I believe right now in this moment, God's telling me that there's someone listening to this who has a huge scar on your heart and you haven't been able to forgive yourself. You haven't been able to get past what happened to you, what you did, what you said, the situation, something, and it's eating you up. It's eating you up. And it's in, 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 I know that my father, my dad has worn this on his heart for over 40 years. And I know that whoever I'm speaking to right now, you've been wearing this for a long time too. My dad's identified his value, his attitude, his confidence, his self-worth, his work, his family, his future, his relationship with God over the words that he spoke on that day to his little sister. And I believe this tragedy, along with a combination of alcohol and drugs to numb the pain, is a big part of why my dad is still on the street today, addicted, unhealthy, stuck in the shame and guilt that he took on when he was 15 years old. And now he's stuck in a 60-year-old man's body with the same mindset, the same guilt, the same hurt, the same pain, because words are weapons. And whether we speak them over someone else or whether someone speaks them over us, it's the same thing. And they hurt. And I feel like someone's listening to this right now who really needs to hear hear it. So hear me out. I want to tell you today, I want to tell my dad today in case he ever listens to this, let go. Let go. Forgive yourself. It's not your fault. Whatever you said, whatever happened to you, whatever someone spoke over you, whatever someone did to you, it's not your fault. It just is. Your past does not define you. Your past mistakes, your past decisions, your failures are not your identity. And it's time right now in this moment, right now in this moment to see yourself how God sees you, not how your parents see you. Not how your coworkers see you. 
Not how your friends see you, not how your spouse sees you, not how your ex-spouse sees you, not how the world sees you, not how you're seen on social media or how the people in church see you or people in recovery groups see you or most importantly, check this out, how you see yourself. It's not about any of that. It's about how God sees you. And God sees you as his son. He sees you as his daughter. He forgives you. And he sees you as a a gleaming, bright light. As cheesy as that sounds, a gleaming, bright light, ready to shine down on others and help bring them out of a darkness. Through what? Through your testimony. Through your story. Through your experience. By sharing it. By opening up. By meeting it head on. And you can do that. But you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. Not true. You do. You just found out. I just found out. All right. This went a little longer than I expected. Let me, let me start to bring this in and we'll close it out today. But I refuse to continue to identify in my performance, my possessions, my stuff, and what people think of me, uh, what I've said to others, what I've said about myself. Um, I think that if we take this mentality and we start to practice this daily, a little bit of this mentality dies daily. It, it takes some time. It doesn't happen overnight. My identity is not locked up in performance. It's not labeling myself the exact thing that had a stronghold over from me. Um, man, like straight up, Jesus saved me from that. He rescued me. He redeemed me. Um, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I got it all figured out. I absolutely don't. God invaded my heart. And he helped me see that my identity is not seen through the lens of this world, that my eternal home is also not here on this earth, that my past hurts and hangups are not my identity, but rather it's in the fact of a lack of ability to see that I was and still am someday spiritually sick because I'm human and I had not fully accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and submitted to him, not just surrendered to him, but submitted to him with 100% of my heart and soul. So check this out. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John three sixteen. That whosoever believes in him, but you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But you don't know who you are. You don't know who. It's starting to make a little sense now because it did to me that whosoever believes in him, but you don't know who you are. Who are you? Who are you? Look, I'm not an expert in this stuff. I'm not even close to it. And I believe that so much of this is honestly beyond human understanding because the more that I've tried to figure things out, the, the less sense it makes. And I have so much to learn. And what I am is exhausted of trying to do everything on my own and exhausted of trying to act like I had it all together, like I have it all together when in fact I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. I know there's someone listening to this right now and you're saying to yourselves like, yes, like, man, what have I got to lose? I'd love to get a little bit of freedom. I'd love to see my life. I'd love to see my identity through God's lens and not my own, not the world's lens. I need some Jesus in my life, maybe. Hey, maybe you're saying that. Maybe you're saying that. If that's you and you want to quit drinking, you want to know more about how God sees you. You want to know more about Jesus. You want to know more about putting the bo- the bottle down and you want to know more about what you can do to help somebody else too. That's huge. Your testimony is important. Your story is important. You're important. Go to that soberguy.com, click on the contact button, send me a message. I'd love to connect with you. I love you guys. I hope this made some sense today. I hope someone heard something that helps you today. Peace, love, and respect. Keep your blood clean.